Thank you everybody for tuning into our YouTube channel today. Today with us we have writer David Hitt with us. Uh, how are you doing, David? Doing good, Wendy. How about yourself? Good. Thanks for coming in and talking to us today. Oh, talking to us today. Get my words twisted there. We're excited to have you here. Um, why don't you tell everybody a little bit about yourself? Okay. Um, well, like you said, my name is David Hitt. I'm from here in Huntsville originally. I went to Ole Miss where I majored in journalism. Um, former newspaper editor, did that for a little while. Today I am working out at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center in strategic communications for space launch systems. So I'm kind of helping to, to sell the next big rocket that's going to send people to Mars. I am like right now finishing up um, the manuscript for my second book. In fact, that's part of why I'm doing this tonight is to procrastinate from having to do that. <laughs> and um, director of a local improv troupe and other things as prescribed. So tell us, how did you know you wanted to be a writer? And how old were you when you discovered that? Oh, <laughs> okay, see, and that's really funny, because I always loved writing. I mean, going back to, gosh, in middle school, I'm, I'm writing my own Star Trek book, right? <laughs> but in terms of, like, knowing that I want to be a writer, completely by accident. I'm in high school, I want to be a graphic artist. Like, I'm going to work for newspapers, and I'm going to be a graphic artist. And back then, you know, okay, you go to college, you want to study graphic arts, you want to study design, you have to be able to, like, draw things. You know, you have to be able to pick up a pencil <laughs> and a paintbrush. And I can't do that at all. I'm doing everything on the computer. But, but you know, you don't go to school for that yet. So, okay, well, you know, I'll, I'll go to college, I'll study journalism, and that'll, like, help me get a foot in the door at newspapers so that I can go do graphics and design. And by the time I graduated, like, oh... Somewhere along the way, I became a writer. You know, how about that? I didn't mean to. Whoops. And, uh, you know, have kind of been a writer ever since. Listen, now, I also know, because we're friends, that you have a great love for space. Mm -hmm. um, and so tell us, uh, like, when do you remember, like, first being fascinated with outer space and all that stuff? Well, and that's, it, it's, it's kind of a very similar story, actually, you know. Growing up in Huntsville, Huntsville's the rocket city, and so, you know, I mean, you, you drive around Huntsville every day, there's just random missiles in different parts of town. Oh, hey, look, there's another missile, you know, and that's just, that's Huntsville. And so I grew up here, and I grew up with all of that. When I was, you know, five years old, my dad, you know, come here, come here, and we'd put me in front of the television, watch the first space shuttle launch, and, uh, and so just grew up loving all of that. And so up until middle school, maybe high school, I guess kind of first half of high school, I'm going to be an aerospace engineer. Like that's what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna graduate from high school, I'm gonna to go to college, I'm gonna study aerospace engineering, I'm looking at what colleges are best for aerospace engineering. And the way I tell the story is, like halfway through high school I realized like that involves math and science and these are hard. Uh, like <laughs> for I'm just most gonna, people, yes. Like I'm just gonna draw pretty pictures of spaceship. That in my mind is what it's gonna I'm just gonna draw look, I drew this spaceship. You know, okay, here's your salary. <laughs> and so completely abandoned that dream, right? So I go off to college, like I said, I'd I, you know, start off in graphics, become a newspaper reporter, go on, become a newspaper editor, and like NASA is, I mean, I'm still a fan, you know, I'm still like watching John Glenn, you know, on the space shuttle, but in terms of, oh, this is something I want to do, just not on the radar at all, and I'm over in Mississippi, I'm working for a newspaper, my mom says, you know, hey, my parents were trying to get me to move back to Huntsville the entire time, and I'm like, mom, I'm, I'm happy, I'm doing newspapers, leave me alone, and she's like, no, you're going to interview with this guy, okay, mom. So I talk to the guy and, um, you know, he tells me what he hires people for and it's like, okay, yeah, that, that I can kind of do, you know, this love of writing and this love of space and being able to bring them together, that's, a lot of people don't get to do that and so I'm really, really blessed that kind of my job is two things I really love put together. I don't know, I mean, it's fascinating to me because I've kind of, we've been friends for a while, eight years I think now, something like, something like that, and so I've kind of watched you go on this journey of that, and it's been pretty cool Listen to the stories that you have uh, that goes along with this. Now, so you worked, um, when I know when we first met, you worked at 
part on was it when you worked at NASA as well? Were mm -hmm. you writing yeah, then? I'd, I'd already started you're not doing the then. same thing that you were doing before, correct? Right. Yeah, so you're I in was, a different job. So what right. was that job like that you did? You write for education stuff? For education stuff. Yeah. Right. And so you know, and so that's the sort of thing I I have from when I was in fourth grade, I think. You know, you you go to the school, you're in elementary school you get like the weekly reader or the scholastic news. I don't know if they still do yeah, that yeah. anymore, but you get the little newsletter. Mm -hmm. And so like one day come in, they hand out it and it's, you know, President Reagan announces space station. And this is 1984. And for some reason, like that was so cool to, to you know, what, eight year old me, nine year old me, whatever. I still have it like somewhere <laughs> in a binder. <laughs> There is That's still awesome. the scholastic news, <laughs> President Reagan announced the space station. And so like now I have this job where I'm the guy doing that. I'm the guy that's writing that for other school kids to read and, and hopefully get them excited. And you know, I love the idea that maybe there's some school kid that has his equivalent of that story, you know, somewhere in a binder of his own. So the... Um so this led up to you actually writing a book about space. Yes. So is there any other details that you, that went from you working at NASA writing education to writing your first book? So the first book, I, the, the, the website that I was writing for in, when I was working for education, we did stories for students and teachers about NASA stuff. And it could just be anything at all NASA related, write it in a way that like, kindergartners can understand, right? Or, or that, you know, I mean, anywhere K-12 can understand. And so trying to come up with ideas, notice that it's the 30th anniversary of Skylab. Well, would that be an interesting thing to write about? And so I start doing some research about Skylab to, to write this article and notice it, there's just not much out there. You know, I mean, there's a lot about the moon landings because, you know, walking on the moon, that's a big deal, really exciting. There's a lot about the space shuttle because back then, you know, we were still doing that. It was the current program. But, you know, I mean, like, poor old Skylab, it's just like the ignored stepchild between these two sexy siblings, you know. Why do you and, think that is? Uh, I kind of for that reason. I mean, one, it was, a, it was a shorter program. There were only three flights, and so not as much awareness. But two, yeah, compared to, you know, one small step for man, <laughs> and compared to, you know, like, now everybody loves the space shuttle because you've got your little stuffed space shuttle and then everything. <laughs> this was long enough ago, and it just kind of fell through the cracks, you know? I'm, I mean, until I was friends and with you, I'd never heard of it, honestly. That's not, not unusual. I'm not a big space that is, person, that, that's so. Even big space people, you know, it, it work. I have to, <laughs> let me tell you about, I'm like the Skylab evangelist. <laughs> have you heard about Skylab? Let me, let me tell you about Skylab. Um, and so, you know, okay, somebody should do something about this. Somebody should write a book about this. And even, I talked to a couple of astronauts when I was working on that story, um, they need to, they need to like have somebody ghost write a book for them. But in my mind, like it would be fun, but that's the sort of thing that professional writers do. You know, people mm -hmm. like me don't ghost write books for astronauts. You know, that's, that's something that professional writers do. And I'm out in, in Houston at the, the museum at Johnson Space Center and they have a big Skylab trainer. And this is, this is like almost exactly 10 years ago. I mean, like next week, it'll be 10 years ago. And I'm out there and I'm still, and I'm thinking again, you know, that would be such a neat project. Somebody should do that. You know, man, I wish I could do that. That's the sort of thing professional. And I'm like, I write for a living. I mean, like every dime I make, I make writing. I think that's the definition. Like if you look up <laughs> professional writer in the dictionary, <laughs> it's somebody that makes their money writing. Wait a second, that's me. <laughs> I could do that. <laughs> and so came home from Houston, sent an email to, uh, to Owen Gary, one of the astronauts that I had talked to, you know, hey, have you ever thought about writing a book? And I'm, I'm going to be clever. I'm like, hey, let me buy you lunch and let's talk about, you know, whether you'd be interested in writing a book. Because in my mind, this astronaut is not going to say, yes, David, I want to write a book with you. Um, but I'm going to get to eat lunch with an astronaut, right? Like, like <laughs> he's going to say no, but I get to eat lunch with an astronaut, so it's still a win. <laughs> well, we go to lunch, you know, we, we go to lunch and at, at Lone Star, it's closed now, um, and we have lunch, and he's like, yeah, you know, I've been thinking about this. This is really great. I'm exciting. Let's do this. <laughs> okay, well, I hadn't thought about the possibility that he would say yes. 
now I have to figure out how you write books with astronauts. <laughs> you know, that's, that's like, okay, step two, step that's one. That's everybody's problem, right? Convince astronauts. <laughs> step two, actually write book, you know. <laughs> step three, profit. It's, it's, but, um, so... So what is the name of the book that you the, wrote? Okay, the first book um, is Homesteading Space, the Skylab Story. Um, Co-wrote it with two of the astronauts, actually. Um, Owen and they Garriott. are... Oh, and Gary, it was the first one that I talked to first, and we started on the process, and we went out to Houston and um, talked to Joe Kerwin, who was also a Skylab astronaut. We're just going out there to interview him for our book, and he's like, well, you know, I've always wanted to write a book, too. And so we're like, okay, we're going to form a super team up, <laughs> and we're all going to work together Is on this, this book. Is this when you uh, told me the story about you eating cookies? Um, so eating cookies was part of, it, it's not that trip out there, but yeah, um... <laughs> One of, well, Owen's commander, uh, the commander of his mission, he flew on the second Skylab flight, was um, a guy by the name of Alan Bean, who, you know, Skylab astronaut, probably more famous for fourth man on the moon. You know, he is the fourth human being to walk on the surface of the moon. And the cool thing is he's come back and he paints now. That's what he does is he kind of has this philosophy that in all of history, there's one guy that can paint what it's like to be on the moon, and that's him, so he has to do it. You know, it's kind of a mandate. <laughs> no one else can, so I must. So he paints about his experiences of being on the moon. And so we go out to interview him, though, not about the moon, but about um, Skylab. And so, you know, we're out there, we're in Houston, um, sitting in his art, well, sitting in his kitchen, which is open to his art studio. So there's this half-finished paintings, and yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm out there, and there's this day that I'm sitting around, you know, eating cookies with a guy that you know walked on the moon. Uh, so that was kind of cool. <laughs> that had to be that was, that like really day. elating. That to you, was like... <laughs> that was. A Did good you pinch day. yourself? <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's fantastic. Um, that was there was that day. There was a day. Okay, so this is this is complicated. Try and follow along, <laughs> but so Owen Garriott, the astronaut, um, I had actually heard of his son before I had heard of him. His son is Richard Garriott, who is a video game designer. Back in the '80s, he writes the uh, the Ultima video games, which were like the first really big successful U.S. computer role playing games. Um, went by the name Lord British, like his his video game screen name, name. Or yes something. right is lord british and lord british is a character in the game mm -hmm. so before i've heard of richard garriott before i've heard of owen garriott i know who lord you know lord british the video game character who is also lord british the real guy who is also richard garriott who is the son of astronaut <laughs> owen garriott okay with me that's so clear far. that's clear so work on the book with owen and we finish the book and, and it's about to come out and around this same time Richard, the son, um, decides that he's going to use all his millions of dollars from writing video games, and he's going to buy a ride on a, on a Russian Soyuz um, to go to the space station. And so for all, all us uneducated space people, tell us what that is. The, 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 the Russian... The Russian Soyuz, it's just their, their little spacecraft. Um, if you're going to ride on a Russian rocket to go to the space station, that's, that's what you're riding on. Okay. You're okay. riding on that's, that's their space station rocket. So, um, you know, in the U.S., to, to fly on the space shuttle, you had to be an astronaut. Russia, you write them a check. Back then, it was like $30 million. Today, it's like 70. million. And, and, hey, congratulations, you're an astronaut. You're going to the space station. So Richard does this. Richard writes a large check. He gets a seat on the, the rocket, and he flies up to the space station. Well, he's doing this around the time that the book is about to come out. So he says, hey, you know, hey, Dad. Let me fly something for you. Um, we print out little copies of the cover of the book, and we autograph them. And we give them to Richard, and he puts them in his space suitcase, and it's loaded up on the Russian rocket, and it flies up to the space station. With well, a space station, and this is really cool. If you've never done this, you need to do this. Uh, you've done this. I've made you see the space station. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we've, we've looked at the space station more than and once. And I've pretended uh, like I've looked at the space you station. You called <laughs> many, many airplanes <laughs> the space station. But so you're aware of this, but you can actually see the space station. You can go out at night if you know when to look, and you can see the space station go over. So when Richard was up there, it's going by at like 5 o'clock on a Wednesday morning or something. So I get up. 
crazy early in the morning, go out in the middle of nowhere, and I look up, and here's this star. And this, on this star <laughs> is my signature that's been carried into space on a Russian rocket by my astronaut friend's son, who is also Lord British, the fictional <laughs> video game character. I mean, it's like... <laughs> Everything I'm surprised I, your, your head is not exploding. Everything I have ever thought cool in life <laughs> was like combined on this one day. So, you know, that, that's kind of a rare day. That's kind of a neat experience. And, and all from, hey, okay, here's, here's your message moment. And all because one day I decided to ask the astronaut instead of just assuming that he would say no. So remember, kids, always try. Uh... <laughs> So also there was a time I remember you telling me a story <laughs> that uh -huh. I really enjoy hearing and I think people would like to hear is when you um, got the chance because someone couldn't go and flew on the... The, the vomit comet. Yes, the zero -G yes, flight. yes. So tell that story. I think that's so uh, okay. fascinating. Well, so it's, it's also part of the same story. Richard... Um, leading up to getting to fly on on the space station as part of his support for the whole space tourism thing part of what they do is they book zero g flights the, the you know they, they call it the vomit comet but it's just an airplane and it does that and when it's doing that you kind of float as you're going over the hill you get to be weightless for 30 seconds or something at a time 20 times in a row, or, or however many times. And it's how they filmed the movie Apollo 13. If you watch Apollo 13, when they're floating around, it's because they are actually inside that airplane for those scenes. Um, so yeah, so Richard had free tickets because he's involved in the company and offered one to his dad. And Owen's kind of, you know, hey, look, dude, I lived up there for two months. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm good. good. <laughs> he, he actually did fly again. Not that long afterwards, but this time, you know, no, I'm good. Hey, David, would you like to <laughs> to be weightless? Would you like to be on the weightless one? Would you like to, to fly on the vomit comet? And, you know, and I think about it for, you know, like point zero 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 three <laughs> seconds <laughs> before, you know, yes, yes, I would. Um, so I go down to uh, to Florida. My flight was, was out of Orlando. And, um, and so I arrived. And, and the first thing, this, this was kind of cool, I, I arrive and I'm there with a friend of mine. We'd gone down, we were going to try and watch a shuttle launch. The shuttle launch didn't go up. Um, in fact, my flight was supposed to land on the shuttle runway, which would have been awesome, but it's reserved because the space shuttle's using it, and so we don't get to it. So we're all out of Orlando, but that's it's okay. Um, but I'm there with a friend, and he's dropping me off so he can take the car, and uh, he's like, that's, that's the Mythbusters. What? <laughs> I, sadly enough, and this shows how uncultured I am, I, I had never even seen Mythbusters until the night before. Like, we're sitting around in the hotel room watching TV. Joe's like, oh, you know, hey, what's on? Oh, man, it's Mythbusters. Let's watch that. And I'm like, the who, what? And so we watch this episode of Mythbusters, and it's great. And so then we go the next day, <laughs> and there they are. They're on the airplane, on the, the Zero-G flight, because they're filming an episode about the moon hoax. They're proving that we did, in fact land on the moon and so they're there they're on the airplane and the airplane can do weightlessness but it can also do um lunar gravity what it's like to be on the moon they can do martian gravity what it would feel like to be on mars um and so they're there and they're in their apollo space suits and they're in the front of the plane and they're showing that you know it really does if you're walking in a space suit in lunar gravity it looks like it did back in the old apollo tapes so so that was kind of cool, you know, the, 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 the Mythbusters were there. Um, I had this preconceived notion <laughs> that, because at that point I've, I've, you know, written about space for years, I've written a book about space, I've talked to a lot of astronauts, like, I, in my mind, know a lot about what it's like to be in space, about what it's like to be in weightlessness. So therefore, in my mind, when I am in weightlessness, I'm gonna rock at this. Like the other people on the flight are gonna <laughs> see me and they're gonna be like, how are you so good at this your first time? Well, you know, I've written a book about space. It's... And um, that turned out not to be the case. <laughs> like it was embarrassing. Like 
Okay, we're going to pose for this picture. Everybody fly like Superman, and you have this picture where there's like 12 people flying like Superman, and there's like David curled up sideways in the <laughs> corner of the picture. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> there's a scene. There's We got a video of the fly. They had cameras at either end of our section, and it's shooting. And, uh, and there's a scene where you see people... <laughs> doing all this cool stuff and then just out of nowhere my rear end appears in view <laughs> bounces off the camera I mean like literally hits the camera bounces off and floats away I was horrible at it so so that was you know it, it was fun I did enjoy it and it was a good lesson in humility so you know win-win yeah, all around <laughs> I'm sorry I forced you to tell this humiliating oh, story. <laughs> I need to put the video on YouTube, you know? <laughs> that would be great. So the so this was some of the things that happened to you as you were writing the book. Mm -hmm. um, so as you sat down, after you did all the interviews and did all oh. these things with and spent time with the astronauts, how, did, how could you decide what to put in the book? Because I had that you had you had to have tons of because I know it's a big book. It is a big book. So I'm sure there are still things that you had to leave out. Um, right? you know, sadly, um, not really that much. <laughs> that explains why it's a big it's, book. Yes, we, we've talked about this. We've talked about this several times since because we went with an academic press. We went with the University of Nebraska Press, and so if we had gone with like. A normal publisher and I and nothing against academic presses I love academic press but if we've gone with a mainstream publisher like you know Random House or, or Morrow or something they would have taken that manuscript and they would have said okay um, thank you but now <laughs> let's turn this into something that we could publish and they would have they would have taken our you know what, almost 600 page manuscript and just torn like 300 page. I mean, they probably would even just... <laughs> <laughs> One, two. Okay, two. yeah. <laughs> um, but we're taking it from this mindset that this is not about making money. This is about preserving this story. I mean, because like I said, that's, that's where it started at the beginning was this story needs to be told. This story, somebody needs to, to capture this story. And so, you know... I mean, a hundred years from now, somebody's building a new space station and they want to know, hey, what did they do back in when they built the first one? Like, this is it. And so, I mean, there's kind of this mindset of anything we don't capture, anything we don't include, anything we don't tell in this story, history never knows. And so, very fortunate that, yeah, I mean, the, the, our press, working with an academic press, they were very indulgent of that. And so, I mean, we did. We aired way too much on the side of let's include everything. And, and I'm glad because, I mean, now it's in the Library of Congress and, like, from here to eternity, you can find that out. You can, those things can be known and otherwise they couldn't be, you know. We have said, okay, now that we've done that, let's go back and let's take those 200 pages or 300 pages out and let's make it something that's a little more accessible. Um, we say that a lot. We do it never, you know? <laughs> it's, it's one of those things. So that was your um, first so book. So that was the first book. And so have you finished the second book or are you working on it now? The second book, um, the way this works, we turned in the manuscript the first time Three years ago yesterday was the first time we turned in the book. And for the second book. For the second book, mm -hmm. right. Yeah, this is, this is how long this process takes. I started working on the second book before the first book was published. So this is now seven years, eight years that I've been working on the second book. Um, turned in the manuscript for the first time three years ago. And... There's a period of like a year where the publisher is kind of, it's in their pile and they're getting around to it. And then like, oh gosh, two years ago, a year and a half, two years ago, I guess, there was a big round of, okay, we're making a whole bunch of edits to it. And now this is now a publishable manuscript. And so that goes then to their proofreader and their proofreader goes through and all, you know, all the issues they have. And so it comes back to us yet again. And we make edits to it yet again and that was back 
August, September, and so we sent it back to them. And so now, two weeks ago, they sent it to us, and this is the page proofs. So this looks theoretically exactly like it will when it's published. I mean, the, you know, you can take the copy that I have today, this word is in the middle of page 203 when it comes out in June, May, June, that same word is still right there in the middle of page 203. It's that level of accuracy. This is just going through making sure not any typos, misspellings, factual errors. So you're you know, not the only one, one that last... probably reads that, right? You have other people that um, read with you? Well, you know, of course, I'm, I've co-authored the book also. This one, um, Heather Smith was my co-worker out at NASA, and so we started working on it when we were both there um, working for education, and so she's got it also, and she and I are both pouring through. The, the instructions that they sent us this time, there's, you know, the, the instruction sheet with the page proofs on the front page. Nobody else will ever read the entire, and, and like, copy yeah. editor, not, not general public. Nobody else will ever read this book again, <laughs> when, like, normal people will, but nobody else will ever proofread this yeah. book again. It is entirely on you, you know, not to screw to keep, it up. Keep yes. it secret. <laughs> um, so yeah, this is the last time anybody does this. And it is the most excruciatingly <laughs> painful thing that a writer can do. One, because you, you read the same page. I mean, I've been reading these pages for how many years now? And it's hard to really focus reading something that you've read that many times and so you're having to really kind of, okay, I am looking at every period, every comma, every semicolon to get it right. And how many pages? This one is <laughs> much shorter. <laughs> this one's only like 300 pages long. So that's a lot of pages to have but to do that to. It is, but the worst part of it though is if you're writing normally, you read something, and you, and you know this, you do this, you know, you write something, you read it again, okay, well, I could say this better. I'm going to go in and I'm going to change this sentence. I don't like the way that I said that. I'm going to say this better. You can't do that with the page proofs. And like I said, every word, you know, you, you can change commas and periods and things like that, but you cannot move one sentence from a page to the next. So if you read something and you hate it and you're like, this is the most embarrassing sentence that I have ever written in my entire life and I don't want anybody to ever know that I even thought about stringing those words together in that order, <laughs> it doesn't matter. You it's grit your teeth and you move on because you can't touch it. And oh, it's <laughs> painful. So working on that now and... Uh, so the book will be out, you said... The official release date is June 1st. Um, generally, the way it works is they start, you know, showing up in bookstores and Amazon and everything May, probably early May before the, uh, the, the official release date. And so what is the name of the second book? Oh, the name of the second book is um, Bold They Rise. Um, it has a subtitle that's like the space shuttle story from 1978 to 1986 or something, but don't quote me on that. But Bold They Rise, you go on Amazon, David hit Bold They Rise, and you'll find it. Um, and it is the space shuttle program from the first time it was ever discussed, like, hey guys, let me, let me, maybe let's build a space shuttle, up through the Challenger accident. So... Losing Challenger, January 1986, um, is where we end the book. So that's kind of the scope of, of what we've written about. So I think that's really cool that you're able to write about the things that you love and that you're passionate about, and then you probably discover even more stuff that you didn't know along the way as you write, right? <laughs> I was reading the book last <laughs> night, and I wrote this book... And I'm learning things. <laughs> After you go back and read it. Because, <laughs> you know, I'm sure either Heather put it in there and I had never noticed it before, or I wrote this and I forgot it. <laughs> but, but I'm like, oh, that's why the space shuttle, right before, right before it launches, you know what I mean? Like T minus one second, it does this number. It's mm -hmm. on the pad and it kind of tilts one way and then the other. And then when it's straight up again, then it takes off. And they call that the twang. And 
like recently, I was now I wonder why it did that. Why, what made the space shuttle do that? And like the answer is in my book, I apparently wrote the answer. <laughs> and so this is really educational. I'm learning all these new things. <laughs> so do you see any books in your future that you'll be writing or are you going to take a break for a little bit? I definitely, definitely take a break for a little bit. Um, the question is just whether the break lasts until I die or ends beforehand. <laughs> That's kind of, uh, like I said, it has been now 10 years. I mean, I have been under contract. I, I've been, I was talking to somebody about this earlier today. They said, oh, you've been writing books for 10 years now. Yes, but I've been under contract to write books for 10 years now. And it's one thing when you're writing because you enjoy it, but it's like another thing when you're writing because there's a piece of paper that you signed that says, David Hitt will write this book. <laughs> and so, yeah, you know, I mean, like next week, I send this manuscript off and I have for the first time in a decade completed my contractual obligation. I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm free. It's, it's, that's quite an accomplishment. Though. It's yeah. I mean, it's, it's Prince. I get to stop being the little symbol and go back to, <laughs> <laughs> to just being, you know, me. Um, so let's talk about a little bit about what, okay. what that means. What other things you mentioned that you are part of comic science improv. Mm -hmm. So, uh, that talk about that for a second and then talk about, um, what are the things that you do? Um, okay, so comic science improv. I, you know, what, 10 years ago, a little more than that now, I'm, I'm living over in Mississippi, and, you know, I'm in a small town, and I'm watching Whose Line Is It Anyway, and, and oh, this is fun. You know, I love this show. This is a great show. And, and I moved from Mississippi to Huntsville, and Huntsville, of course, is metropolitan and cosmopolitan enough that I'm at work one day, and there's this poster for face-to-face -face improv, so, like, there is this thing that in Mississippi you had to watch on TV. They do it live in Huntsville. <laughs> and so this is really exciting. So, hey, let's go, let's go watch this face-to-face this -face improv. And um, so I did. And, and I went and watched the face-to-face -face improv for, like, four years. I'm sitting in the audience for four years watching this improv troupe. And, um, and the whole time, like, the whole four years... I'm like, oh, I could totally do that. You know, I could totally do that. I'm, I'm sitting there in the audience, and they would do the, the warm-up 101. You know, 101 whatever's walking to the coffee shop, and one of the whatever's goes, oh, the bartender or the barista, and orders a coffee, and the barista says, I'm sorry, we don't serve your kind here. And the whatever says, you know, something funny, insert punchline here. And, and they're doing that, and I'm sitting there in the audience, and I'm just boom, 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 coming up with stuff. Um, oh, I could totally do that. And, and that's easy to say sitting in the audience. Like, <laughs> sitting in the audience for four years saying I could totally do that <laughs> is easy. And after four years, you know, put up or shut up, right? So I go to the director, um, hey, you know, I'd really like to, sh to you know, to, to take a shot at this. I want to see if I really can do it. Um, so, yeah, come on, come to, come to rehearsal. And, and the way this works, you know, as, as you know, you show up at rehearsal and you just rehearse until you're ready to be on stage. Um, so yeah, so I go in, oh man, I can totally do this. And it turns out, oh man, no. <laughs> it's kind of like the spatial I, ride that you took I, on the boat. It, 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 yes. <laughs> um, I know this because I speak you, from experience. <laughs> you and yeah, and you, well, and you know, um, in my case, the director, Gene, like after I, after I finally made it onto stage and after I'd been playing for, I mean, probably like a year or something, he pulled me aside and said, you know, David, I want you to know I'll give anybody a chance, but you were the one of the ones that I really thought would never actually make it. <laughs> uh, uh, Trevor, you know Trevor. Trevor started in the troupe the same time that I did. Um, I mean, we start a week apart, and like Trevor, he's on stage, he's performing, he's an official well, he's member Trevor of the troupe, Britain. and and I'm you know mm. still like running into walls and stuff. I mean, <laughs> it was. It was, it was a process. So how did you get from face-to-face -to, -face to comic science? So comic science, face-to-face um, -face went on for, for 10 years. Um, Gene, the director, you know, started the troupe. We do the 10th anniversary show. After the 10th anniversary show, he sends out letters saying, you know, hey, it's been a good run. I think 10 years is enough. I'm moving on. You know, he's, he's now doing other stuff with the face-to-face -face brand. Um... And the rest of us are, okay, but 
but, but we didn't want to stop doing improv. <laughs> we're not through. You may be through, <laughs> but but we're not through. Um, so we. Um, well, let's okay. We're we're, we're fine. We'll, we'll, we'll just make our own troop. <laughs> um, so you know, we we kind of have some meetings and kind of start discussing stuff. And it's really interesting because the old troop, um, the director, you know, was kind of it was his troop, and he, he had a very very you know firm grasp on the direction of the troop, and and it was kind of this is the way we're going to do things. And, uh, and we didn't realize, like, how much that was the thing keeping the group together. Because improv troops tend to be made up of very creative people. And very creative people <laughs> tend to kind of have their own way of thinking about things. They're very hippie-like. <laughs> so, yes. So, you know, Gene kind of releases the firm grasp, but all these cats just kind of, whoo, all over the place. <laughs> And okay, so how do we how do we put this back together? But um, but so comic science was what came out of that. We've been going now for this summer will be two years. Um, I kind of accidentally ended up being the director of that. Um, but <laughs> which again is one of those you know those message sort sort of stories that you know okay look. <laughs> If the guy that really should have never been there in the first place <laughs> can somehow end up as the director of the troupe, you know, persevere, hang in there, work hard, because you never know, you know. Um, but it is a a very good group of people. and um, So you guys do shows? We uh... do, yeah. So we do, like, um, once or twice a month we do just kind of shows, I mean, very much like what you would see on uh, on Whose Line Is It Anyway. And so where can people find out about those shows? Um, you can find out about those shows either at comicscienceimprov.com. Um, you can find us on Facebook. Just go into Facebook, Comic Science Improv. You can find us and, you know, we create events for the different shows. And so that's a good way to keep up with what we're doing. Twitter. Um, if you use Twitter, we are Comic Scientist on Twitter. Um, we have a Pinterest. Um, we have not put anything on Pinterest in like a year, but it exists. Um, but yeah, no, so, so probably Facebook and our website are the best way to find out about it. And then we'll make a link below the video okay. so people can Excellent. click on if they want to, to, um, find out more about Comic Science. Excellent. So, um, the only other question I have for you is about how does doing improv enhance your writing? Uh, that's okay. That's that's a really good question, and and I was having this conversation with somebody uh, the other day that is a writer that doesn't realize it, but totally needs to do improv. And so I'm trying to sell her. Okay, here's why you need to do improv, and here's why, as a writer, doing improv would help you. And because your first reaction is like, not only are these two things not related but they are exact opposites. Like if you're doing theater, you either write and you have a script and, and that's traditional theater, or you don't write and you don't have a script and that's improv. And so, you know, like theoretically, it's like pasta and antipasta. If they come together, it explodes, right? <laughs> um, but, and the example that I gave was when I was in college and for a few years afterwards, I did a comic strip. And, and I wrote this comic strip with a couple of friends of mine. And so it was really interesting because sometimes the three of us would work together and write like an episode of the strip. But then sometimes one of us would go off, hey, I wrote some strips, well, we're in a hurry. Okay, just slap it on there. I don't, I don't care. <laughs> I trust you. I don't need to see what you've done. And so there's these characters in this comic strip and I'm one of their creators and I'm one of their writers and so like to some extent you know you you create a character you write a character you're making it do whatever it does but these characters have two other people that sometimes are writing them so my experience is there's these characters that I created that I write that I, that <laughs> That, that I put words in their mouth, except sometimes they just run off and say stuff on their own. I mean, like, sometimes <laughs> they're just doing... I didn't make them do that. I didn't have anything to do with that. These characters, they just do things and say things and have words that they say that I didn't put in their mouth. And, I mean, it's, 
it, the reality is because it's you know these two other people doing it but from where I'm sitting sometimes I tell them what to do and sometimes they just do things and when that when that happens okay now I'm writing for this character but I have to be true to who this character is I mean because this character is not only who I'm making him be he's got this life of his own and so when I'm writing for him, I'm having to channel into who he really is. When you're on stage doing improv, if you're doing it right, that's what you're doing. I'm, I'm on stage and this, there's this character and if you're sitting in the audience, he looks a lot like me. He's got my facial hair and, and he's stuck with, you know, with, with my body and all this stuff, poor guy. But it's, it's this different person that for the, the duration of this scene is living in, in my body. But it's, it's not me. It's this different person doing things. People, you know, oh, I couldn't do improv because um, I'm too slow. You know, I would be too slow to come up with stuff. And, and, I've, and I've had this conversation with people, you know, who are studying improv. And, I'd, and I'll sit there and I'll ask them a few questions. And it doesn't matter what I'm asking. I'm just asking stuff at random. You know, oh, why do you think that? And they'll answer. And, um, you know, well, what would you like to be able to do? And they'll answer. And, you know, when do you have this problem? And they'll answer. And I said, okay, you realize what just happened was improv. There was no script for this conversation. We were talking totally unscripted. I'm giving you, as your scene partner, a stimulus, and you, as my scene partner, are responding. Right now, the characters that we're playing are ourselves, so it's very easy for you to respond because you know what you would think, but it's, it's, but it's improvised. It, there's, there's no script. You're just coming up with it. When you're being slow is when you're trying to think about what somebody would say. When I ask you a question, you don't think, you know, if I ask you a question, you don't think, oh, gee, what would Wendy Morgan say in this situation? You know, I mean, you just, yeah, you just respond. <laughs> right. And so when you're at that point that you're not trying to think, hey, what would, you know, the first cow on Mars say? You just kind of are there and you are the first cow on Mars. Answer, moo. Um, <laughs> but, but, uh, but it just, it comes out. You don't have to worry about being slow anymore. And so... You learn to do that during improv. You learn to, I'm not thinking about what this character would do. I'm simply being this character and letting this character respond to the situation. Okay, now I go over into my writing and I'm, you take that mindset and you apply it over here. I'm not trying to force an outcome. I'm not trying to make this character get to point A or say this thing. Now what I'm doing is I am putting this real person in this situation and letting themselves get out of it. You know, you, as, as the writer, you create the stimulus that they're responding to, but if you're, if you're writing and you are forcing a character to do things, it can be contrived. And so the more you're able to kind of get to that point of just natural reaction, whether it's improv or whether it's writing, just the more organic the, the whole situation is. And so there's times for editing and all that kind of stuff, but I think it really, probably from your experiences, that it frees you up to write whatever you want to write. You learn to trust yourself. <laughs> yeah. I mean, whether it's on stage or whether it's writing, you learn to trust what I'm doing is okay, you know. And, and that, somebody had asked me the other day, um, you know, what if you could subscribe, uh, describe improv in one word, what would that be? And I just told them freedom, sure. because you you come to the point where you have it, but you can also add trust and confidence in there too, because those are two words that also come to mind. Yeah. And it gives you that. So. Yeah. Well, we will look for your book on Amazon, and we will. Uh, Check out Comic Science Improv for more information for tickets. Thank you for coming over and talking oh, to me today. It my was, pleasure. It was a pleasure for me as well. And um, we will see you another time. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you.